I'm particularly pleased to be talking about Wedinos today. It's a project very close to my heart and something that we're very proud of in Wales. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking to you basically about Wedinos, what, we, what Wedinos is. Um, for those of you that haven't already heard about it. Essentially, it's a project that is designed to collect uh, samples of drugs and histories and, and detail around adverse effects that individuals have experienced following con consum uh, consumption of drugs. We test the drugs and then we put all of the information back out to the whole population. So any individual can submit a sample of drugs, organizations can submit samples. We have amnesty bins um, that don't have effects details, but I'll come more to that. So essentially, it is evidence-based. This is toxicology. We work closely with the National Poisons Information Service to make sure that we can provide really accurate, timely harm reduction information for people who are using or considering use of both new psychoactive substances, combinations of illicit and illicit drugs, or complete unknowns, to be honest, and we do get a lot of those. I think the, the essence of this project and what makes it so different is that we actually have a communication directly with individuals who are using drugs. Uh, very often, and I've worked in this field for a number of years now, I find that lots of projects are set up so that academics can find out stuff and let other academics know, um, which kind of defeats the, the purpose of the um, harm reduction for me. So at the very center of this, we have a direct dialogue with individuals who are using drugs and we talk back and we have a two-way dialogue. In addition to that, we engage proactively uh, with the ambulance service and with uh, emergency departments, with uh, drug services, specialist drug services right through low threshold to tier four, all, all areas of criminal justice from the police, prisons, probation, yacht services. Um, uh, the, the wider sort of recreational drug using communities and free party goers, uh, local authorities, housing, education, and forums. So we're engaged actively with the forums online, both specific to MPS, but also wider forums in terms of parent discussion groups and concerned parents um, and individuals, again, who are using um, drugs. In terms of the structure of the service, essentially what we need to do is collect samples in, so they are submitted to us, and they need to be tested in our TOX lab, which is based in Cardiff. We have various routes that, um, for transportation, as I'm sure you're aware, transportation, possession, all of these issues have been challenging for us, but we've been able to set up a system that is robust and we're in the second year now of, of, of fully full service. So we're able to um, receive samples from the ambulance and from emergency departments, both um, for fines that ambulance have, but also if an individual is ad admitted to hospital and is happy for that sample to be tested, along with the adverse effects and symptoms that they're experiencing, that comes to us. We have direct communication by the postal service um, for MPS users, but also users of, of um, a range of other drugs. Academics and specialists, often um, individuals will come, academics and people in forensics, for example, will come across a substance that they're not really sure of. We can test it for them. Um, and the police, I have to say, have been absolutely extraordinary, signed up right from the beginning and instrumental in helping us safely uh, encourage individuals to submit samples and we use their transport mechanism to get them to the tox lab in what is uh, an evidence bag. So this is the same evidence bag that the police use, but we're able to, with a, with a branding on it, um, use the same mechanism for individuals anonymously to submit samples for testing. And through this mechanism, we receive samples from all of these different services, including amnesty bins, um, in nightclubs, etc., where there are no adverse effects because we don't know who has submitted. 
Um, along with the pack, the Wedenos pack, I have an example here, um, is the sample bag and the effect sheet that's shown here. Um, and all of this service is anonymous. The only data we're collecting about the person themselves is the age, gender, and area of residence so that we can map trends in different types of drug use but also harms that are being experienced. Uh, we ask purchase intent, what did you intend to buy? What did you think you were buying? Uh, the sample details, and that's in effect the form of it, whether it's granular, white, white powders, et cetera, et cetera, pills, so that there's an audit trail, um, so that what we think we, what they are submitting is the same as what we receive in the TOX lab. Um, we also ask about other drugs used at the same time so that we can get a sense of what people are using in combination and also potentially um, contraindications. Method of consumption, be it oral, sniff, smoke, so injecting, for example, so that, again, we can look at trends in use as they uh, differ across, uh, across the UK. And then at the bottom here, uh, we look at expected and unexpected effects. What did you expect to happen and what happened to you that you really didn't expect? Okay, and there's a section at the bottom just to ask for any outcomes, particularly hospitalizations and the more severe end of, of um, unexpected effects. In terms of the results, just in terms of process, so it comes to the lab, the sample comes to the lab, along with the effect sheet, the sample is tested, the effect sheets are analyzed and entered into. If we know what the drug is fairly simply, or combinations of drugs, we can put it straight on the website, and we're averaging 48 hours between uh, receipt at the TOX lab to, to publication of the, of the results, so it's really timely. We have, in fact, been criticized because they say it's not quick enough. Um, <laughs> I want to take it this evening, but you know, genuinely, it's not possible to do it any quicker than that. Um, if we don't know what it is, we then further test it in a process called NMR, in the uh, Cardiff uh, Pharmaceutical Medicines so that we can break it down and really understand what's going on. And uh, this process has been used actually, I think, in 12 um, substances that were completely unidentified. We then report those to the European Monitoring Centre for the early warning system to give a heads up that we've received a sample of something completely new. So everything eventually goes on the website and this is the website. It's really, really straightforward for those of you who haven't seen it. Three main mechanisms. You can submit a sample for testing. You can see your results. You can see the results that we've had right across the board. And you can obtain uh, specialist substance information, including uh, tailored harm reduction information. And as I said, we tie in with the National Poisons Information Service so that we can provide a really robust evidence base of what is known around these substances and how toxic they, they might be. Um, it's constantly changing, sorry. Uh, just to further note, we do have the opportunity, it's a bit blurred here, but for a news alert. So if, uh, for example, we receive a news alert from Europe that a drug has caused fatalities via the early warning system, and I know um, the UK Drugs Watch is, is also feeding into this, so we can put, put the alert up as soon as we receive it. And uh, we have obviously social media, which my colleague Dean is much better at than I am. So, <laughs> so it's quite an interactive process. Um, you can contact us, admin at Wedinos, and we have a lot of dialogue with people who are saying, um, I'm concerned about this, your results gave me this, but I thought it was something else. So there is an opportunity for dialogue there. Um, so that's the process. And then all of these people then access that information. So it goes in, we test it, we profile it, and it goes straight back out to all of the people that have access. Um, in the last year, 42% of our samples came from outside of Wales, so across other parts of the UK. We welcome this. Uh, well, uh, Welsh Government actually fund this project so that we don't really tell them that 42% of the samples don't come from Wales. <laughs> but the fact is that it's a fairly borderless world that we live in now. 
Um, so we're really happy to, to test, but if anybody wants to contribute, that's fine. Um, we've also received uh, samples as far away as Japan, a lot in Europe and stuff. Now, we don't publish those. We do let them know their results, but we don't publish them because if we did, we would be truly inundated. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty pragmatic um, approach there. So what have we found? As I said, we've been up uh, and running for since October 2013, um, having got everything in place for a number of years. And this is data that's just going to be published next week, so it's not out yet, from our second annual report. And if I can take you from the left uh, to the right, uh, we've had to, well, up, up to the 1st of October, we had just under 4,000 samples, um, of which 305 um, different substances were identified, which is extraordinary given that I've been working in this field for many years and I was used to about five uh, before, uh, very long ago. So that's the total um, in the last two years. But just taking the last year, um, 1,840 received. We do have a process and I'm sure you'll have questions about this, but there are some, we, we had great criticism and concern that this tool would be used as a quality control tool by drug dealers, da da da, da. Um, In the main, we are completely able to allay any fears and we are very pragmatic. I'll leave it at that. Um, but where samples have no information at all and just the sample is sent in with no other information, we, we have an algorithm not to test that, but we do the feed that back. Um, and I have to say, these, these ones that are pending, we've now tested over 4,000, I think, haven't we, Dean? 95% um, of them are psychoactive in its broadest sense. We do test image and perform enha performance enhancing drugs, but they are from Sentinel providers in the last year because we got inundated and we reached saturation very quickly. So we were just testing the same. Um, steroids and image enhancing drugs again and again which wasn't actually adding to anything but we do still have the facility to test and we do test from sentinel providers Liverpool John Moores being one of them um, SCRA synthetic cannabinoids are by far the most common interestingly half of the ecstasy samples that were submitted didn't contain any MDMA and I'm going to come on to a little bit more about that 21% um, of the samples that were submitted as legal actually were controlled substances. But interestingly, we also have samples that were submitted as controlled substances containing non-controlled substances. So there's a, this, this whole notion of new psychoactives, and I know you're coming on to this, is a bit of a mishmash by now, to be fair. Um, but beautifully in the last year, everybody said it will be a flash in the pan and you'll be all right. We've seen a 25% increase in submissions in the last year. Again, just some data around age um, and gender. Obviously, as I said, this is anonymous, but we do collect basic demographics. And as you... Ooh, sugar. Sorry. Um, it's the light I was looking for. Um, so the majority group are in the 20s. This whole notion, and I don't know so much about English, but Welsh press are always, they're, they're 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. We're not seeing it. We do hear about it and we work with youth vending and, and other youth groups and schools, but we're just not seeing what the press are telling us. Um, but a huge age range, up to 68, fair play. <laughs> So, the top 10 most common drugs. One of the, one of the uh, concerns that are always raised with us when we do the I really like that too. Uh, one of the concerns that we have, because obviously we do a lot of training around new psychoactives and, and drug services, and, and everybody's going, I can't keep up, I can't keep up. Genuinely, oops. Um, as you'll see from this, we have non-movers. The synthetic cannabinoids, there will always be there. Highest submissions, fairly steady, thank you very much. Um, a couple of changes here. We had, I, I think, Wales heralded 
methadone as the finest drug to come out of anywhere um, for ages. That we really embraced it in Wales. Um, but as I said, it's a, f a fairly 50-50 split now in the samples that we've got. So there was just one change in the last year, methiopropamine uh, for methadone, ethylphenidate. I know Edinburgh really likes its ethylphenidate. Um, so we're not seeing huge, huge changes in the main new psychoactives that we're seeing year on year. Not the hundred and odd that were recorded by the EMCDDA in the last year, for example. Um, classifications. I think one, one of the things um, um, where, where we record, what did you intend to buy? Um, it's really interesting. A lot of these unknowns, I, I, I must point out, are from amnesty bins because we have no information about what people intended to buy or what they thought it was. Um, but in the uh, grey slide you'll see what people believed the legal status to be of the substance that they were submitting. Um, and the red is what it actually is. And you can see, as I said, sam samples that were believed to be uh, legal high, I hate that term, but legal high, uh, ended up as being controlled. But also the other way around, con what were believed to be controlled also contained legal highs. So a huge combination, but, but certainly implications about what you're carrying around believing it to be a legal high. Um, so just to touch on two kind of key findings we found, SCRAs, again, for those I'm sure you've, if, you, if you know me well enough, I say it's not legal cannabis, please don't use this term, completely different, much, much different in terms of, of implications for individuals. Um, and it belies some of the really serious adverse effects and hospitalizations that we've seen with this substance. Um, we've profiled 32 different SCRAs, um, but again, the two most common um, were highlighted earlier. We've had this chronic haze, I don't know if you've come across it, but it actually contains six different substances. Um, and beautifully, we have, we have great dealers in, um, in the valleys in Wales, and they make magic bags. So when you've finished sorting all of your stuff out for the different deals, you just scrape everything else into a bag, and that's your magic bag. So that might be one of those, I'm not sure. Um, but again, products that are, were branded as the same, SCROs that had the same packaging, the same everything marketing, containing different substances. Um, here are some of, just a brief um, touch on some of the effects. I, I indicated that people complete the effect sheet where they've had adverse effects or expected and unexpected effects. And this is for SCRAs as a group. Um, and highlighted in blue are all the ones that you probably really wouldn't want if you were expecting anything like cannabis. Um, so the data that we're getting from unexpected effects is reinforcing what we're finding in terms of uh, hospitalizations. And we can feed this back to people um, directly. In prisons, we have five prisons in Wales and all of them contribute to Wedinos. None of the samples, and I must hasten to add, none of the samples that we receive can or ever have or ever will be used in evidence. They're non-evidentiary samples. So even prison samples, they cannot be associated with an individual. Um, and the police and the prisons have been fantastic about it, I have to say. So again, what we're seeing, and this is borne out in the press, synthetic cannabinoids, lots and lots of bunk, fillers, and buprenorphine. And this is, this is really borne out in what we're finding anecdotally elsewhere as well. Um, you will have seen, I think, the, uh, a lot of media around prison and uh, prison crisis from Spice. I don't think it's going to go down. My colleague works extensively uh, across the five prisons, but I know it's not unique to Wales. This is a, is a huge issue right across the UK. Um, and I don't think it's going to go away, to be fair. Um, more addictive than crack was the last one we said. Um, just to, to touch on, and I am winding up, I promise, 
One of the things, one of the really interesting things that we found in the submissions is people, just an umbrella term, if you like, for ecstasy. Any, any and lots and lots of really weird stuff is just sold as ecstasy. We've had 76 samples in the last year, just in the last year. 51% contained MDMA. Only 51% contained only MDMA. The rest contained MDMA and another substance. One contained something that had no psychoactive properties at all, uh, in which case you're just quite cross. Um, but the most common substitutes were alpha PVP, methylone, and ethylone. I think the point here, and, and we are short for time, but the point being around the substitutes is actually that for other drugs, smaller amounts of, of the drug are, are required for the same effect, but also may have a much longer onset period. In which case, you're taking more than you need to, and you take, you're redosing because the effects are not kicking in. And we have seen a lot of hospitalizations in Wales as a consequence of this. So that kind of information is really important. We're able to feed back uh, the different names that um, people have. So lots of samples were submitted as magic. One contained 5 meal adult caffeine, the other one cocaine. Clockwork Orange, again, I'm, I'm referring to the same sort of marketing, same branding, labeling, um, but containing different substances. This were, these were submitted by a youth service. They had a load of uh, 15, 16 year olds um, who were bleeding from the throat and really swollen, and it was very nasty hospitalization. <coughs> And these were, these were bought 20 miles apart from each other but contained the different substances, both from head shops. Sparkle is, a, is another one. NDAI in one, cocaine, methadone, and ketamine in the other, leading to a hospitalization. So, yeah. Um, the other, and this is a, an example of, of the data that we produce, really important. We're seeing an increase, and I don't know whether you are also, um, but an increase in fentanyls and derivatives. And actually that harm reduction information is really important because most people wouldn't associate, ah, oh, you can use naloxone in that situation, so keep it to hand. Um, so we can provide appropriate harm reduction information. We produce a quarterly report, a filter, which means potion, by the way, it wasn't trying to be clever, it just means potion. Um, and this report here is our annual report which is coming out next week. It's available off the website, so please look at it. My very final comment, and I know my colleague Neve is uh, going to talk to you about the new psychoactive substances bill, um, but just to say that we, I have been working very hard with colleagues in Welsh Government because we were very concerned about the implications of the new bill to Wedinos. Um, and we were trying to get Wedinos as a named exemption on the, on the bill. We didn't achieve that, but what we do have is a formal statement exempting all contributors of Wedinos from the new psychoactives bill, so it should have no implications for individuals who are submitting samples, um, which is of paramount importance to us. Um, and that's me. Thank you.